Hello, this is Andrew Al from Digital Charlotte, and welcome to the Digital Inclusion Exchange podcast. Today, we'll be listening to the Di- National Digital Inclusion Alliances, also known as the NDIA's Net Inclusion Webinar Series. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance Net Inclusion Conference has been a staple in the digital inclusion community for years, bringing hundreds of practitioners, advocates, academics, internet service providers, and policymakers together to share their knowledge. With social distancing in place, the NDIA is hosting the Net Inclusion 2020 webinar series to replace the conference. This series includes eight one-hour webinars recorded live from September 16th through November 4th. You can find the full schedule, recordings, and resources at digitalinclusion.org slash net inclusion 2020 webinar series. The link to this will be in the description. Today's webinar topic is what new digital inclusion models, partners, and funding are coming together due to the pandemic. First recorded on October 21st, 2020. Enjoy. Webinar is now live. (laughs) I'm Angela Sifra. I'm the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. This is our fifth in our series of eight net inclusion webinar series. This is our replacement to our annual conference that we usually have in person and we will again someday. Uh, We've been very fortunate to have amazing folks on the ground doing digital inclusion work to join us for each of these webinars. Today, we're going to talk about how we've uh, pivoted and adjusted and found new partners and funding for digital inclusion work. Uh, per this uh, incredible time that we're in right now. Uh, So this webinar is being recorded. This one and the previous ones are all on the website along with a handy dandy list of all the links that will be shared. For Q&A, please use the Q&A portion on Zoom. And also we want this to be interactive and engaging. So use the chat. Tell us what's going on in your town, what's going on with you. And uh, our panelists love talking to folks. That's why they've agreed to do this. And so they will happily respond. Okay, we're going to get started. Let's do the quick, uh, who is everybody today? Uh, We're going to do that by asking everyone uh, what their role is in their organization and where you are based. Cammie, you want to go first? I would love to. Cami Griffiths, I'm the executive director and co-founder of Community Tech Network, and we have our headquarters in San Francisco, but I actually am located outside of Austin, Texas. I moved here three years ago to establish an office here and to expand our programming. And Cami is on the NDIA board of directors, so it's kind of like having a boss on a call. It's fine. I'm not concerned. <laughs> uh, Lazone. Lavonne Grays, um, President and CEO of IBSA Incorporated. We are based in Topeka, Kansas. Great, thank you, Lavonne. And Krista. I am Krista Vinson. I'm a program officer at Rural Lisk. I'm based in Charlotte. We have a fully remote team, and Rural Lisk is active with community-based organizations in 45 states. Fabulous, thank you, Nicole. Hi, Nicole Yumayam. I'm the Digital Inclusion Library Consultant at the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records. We're a division of the Arizona Secretary of State, and I'm coming to you live from Tempe, Arizona. Thank you. Okay, so the way that we run this is that I ask folks questions. I'm only going to ask you all the same question once, and after that, it's all different questions, just to shake it all up, of course. Uh, But for all of these, we're asking our guests to keep their comments quick so that we can keep this moving and keep everyone engaged. So the first question for you all to answer is, what makes your digital inclusion work unique? Because you all have such a unique perspective this. I'm going to start again with Cami. Great. So Community Tech Network works only in partnerships. So we don't have computer centers of our own. We support other organizations, senior centers, housing development, social service agencies, workforce development. And our staff and volunteers work directly with the learners from those partners, but we also train trainers from those partners to work with their learners. My hope is that these agencies will be able to implement digital inclusion programs of their own someday as part of their programming. But because of COVID, we had to turn our in-person training into virtual training. So we launched a program called Home Connect that does focus on helping people sign up for internet 
get a device, mostly tablets are what we're training on because we're working with older adults and we provide remote training over the phone using a screen share program. And that programming is being offered in English, Spanish, Cantonese, Mandarin, and Tagalog. And so we've learned a bunch from all of this and I'm happy to tell you more later. I love it, perfect. And Nicole, tell us what, how, what it makes your digital inclusion work unique. Yep. So I am a part of a state library agency and every state and US territory has something like a state library. And this allows us to have a statewide perspective of um, digital equity issues and just library services um, issues throughout Arizona. We do not regulate or tell libraries what to do, but we support them in a number of different ways. So my particular department is called library development and our mission is to empower Arizona libraries. So we spend a lot of our time administering federal funding um, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, as well as supporting libraries for things like broadband infrastructure build outs through the e-rate process as well. Um, we also um, support different state level initiatives that, um, that we might design. Um, and we make that available to libraries in a number of different ways, um, whether that's through subgrants or consulting or you know, figuring out what the continuing education opportunities are for library staffs to be empowered as local digital equity um, champions. Um, as a state agency, we also have a seat at the table at national conversations and state level conversations. So we're um, representing libraries and the role that libraries have in this changing environment, as well as trying to be um, squeaky wheels for what digital equity is with that really expansive concept of digital equity moving beyond um, kind of short-term solutions. Um, and importantly, um, our, our department also collects a lot of um, data related to public libraries and um, their ability and capacity to serve their communities as well as their digital infrastructure. And I believe we have a map that we can share um, to give you an example of uh, what that looks like. Um, and I, I, oh, I see in the chat, um, I forgot to mention, um, because the State Library has a history of administering LSTA funding to get resources to libraries directly, we were able to get out about um, $657,000 uh, of CARES Act funding to support libraries in responding to the pandemic. And a lot of that is tapping libraries to do things like expand their Wi-Fi um, and um, get more devices out, as well as to think about um, partnerships locally. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. And that fabulous map, the link for that is in the chat for you all. Lazone, how is your digital inclusion work unique? Well, thank you for having me. First off, by great, a great honor to be amongst other practitioners and great leaders within our communities. I think that one of the uh, reasons that our work is unique is because of our affiliation with uh, NDIA. Uh, I receive a lot of information on a local level. There's not a lot of people who have been knowledgeable about the digital divide, digital inclusion. I have been able to learn from the best of you all. And I use that information. I'm the only one in Topeka, our state capital, uh, who probably can bring reason to the table, good research, best practices and things that I've done. And I use that information to go and speak at City Hall, to speak with people who work for the state, because if they do not want to take my word for it, uh, getting the information and sh that I've shared it from the, uh, the NDIA gives it credibility. So I think one of the unique parts of our work is that I'm very active and vocal, uh, knowledgeable on the area. And that has woken up a lot of people uh, back then, nine years ago, uh, it's Lazone. But once the pandemic happened and all this thing moved towards distant learning, then everything that I had been saying became credible. So I think that unique part is we have to have people who are very knowledgeable on this on the local level, who have an ability to engage the local leadership, whether that's government officials, business leaders, nonprofit executives, those who are over the community foundations, there's a lot of money and foundations and companies. I don't think that they don't want to not help, but they don't know how and don't know where to start. And other than trying to share information just to have them throw money at something, I try to use this base of affiliates and NDIA 
to gather the right information and share it with them. Secondly, I think part of why we're unique is we can go from research to advocacy, but at some point in time, we actually have to go to application. And when we're talking about the population that we serve, we're talking about poverty and low income. And we're trying to focus on not just the workforce development part of it, but the breaking the cycle. Whereas we have a lot of young people who are very already tech skilled, but they are not tech honed. And so we have been focused on our efforts to get young people who are already a little bit tech savvy to see the bigger picture of how these tech skills can translate into better careers, jobs, income as entrepreneurs. We're the only one who are really doing uh, tech-based type of program. So uh, digital inclusion, if it's about the device, the access, then it gets to the literacy. And we have to move beyond just, this is how you move a mouse. This is uh, how you turn on a screen. And even with the distance learning at school, we have to uh, show them that it's more than just completing and uploading an assignment. There are other things that they can learn and do to bring some income into the household. So we're sort of the only ones in our lane doing that. And I think that that's what makes us, makes us unique where we are at. Great, thank you. And we'll come back to that for a little more detail, Lizone. Krista, tell us what makes rural LISCs work in digital inclusion unique. Thank you. And I noticed that Miles put our full name, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, in the chat. Um, as one of the nation's largest, largest community development financial institutions, LISC does have an urban footprint. Um, but on the rural side of the house, we are looking to import or export, I guess, uh, through community-based organizations, the fields uh, definition of what a digital navigator model is and can accomplish. So we're just really grateful to NDIA, uh, the staff and the network that helped influence our program design. And we think we have a unique offer to make in rural communities. Um, rural LISC is deeply committed to rural places and to regions of persistent poverty like Appalachia um, and the Delta where we launched our pilot digital navigator program. And we feel that the path to economic opportunity, as Tammy was saying, runs through community-based organizations. So our model is, is deeply dependent on partnerships, um, you know, small business owners, entrepreneurs, leaders who may not have a title in rural places are just instrumental in, in getting work done. So um, we are importing, exporting, however you want to put it, the digital navigator model um, by embedding it in community-based organizations um, to, uh, to reach for individuals um, with the digital inclusion portfolio alongside the other um, supports that these organizations provide their clients. Awesome, thank you. So I think we should jump right into the money question because that's where folks are, are often struggling, right? Is how do we find the funds to pay for what we're working on? Uh, during this moment in time, we have more attention on digital inclusion than we've ever had before. There is the more potential for fundraising uh, and for finding consistent sources of funding because we don't have to explain that important connectivity is important like we used to. I mean, we still have to to a certain extent, but not nearly like what it was pre-COVID. So um, I think one of the some of the fascinating work going on is the attempt to convince various uh, agencies, government agencies at all levels, local, state, and federal, that existing funding sources should be uh, adjusted to cover connectivity devices, digital literacy training. And Lazone is in the midst of this process with the state of Kansas and has generously agreed to share his story with us. Uh, so Lazone, can you start with us at the beginning of your story? how it came about. Well, we've been talking about the digital divide for a long time. I've been talking about it 2009. And even back then, uh, was trying to get our state welfare agency, when you understand the welfare policies, welfare to work reform, six years maximum, different states can do different things. Kansas is 24 months maximum to receive cash assistance. And uh, TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, these are mostly single parents that have a dependent in the home. And so uh, 
being a part of NDIA and the listserv, there was some information that came across that uh, the state agencies, TANF and SNAP, food assistance, could be using their reserve dollars, TANF dollars, to purchase computers, pay for internet access, and to pay for digital literacy. And this was the sort of the silver bullet that I wish I could have had in 2009, because uh, a lot of state agencies who had to shutter their doors, a lot of them at the top really don't know what's going on and what's available, what they can do. And so that information became very valuable to me because it was from HHS. And so when I shared it with the uh, state agency, uh, if they asked if they could purchase computers, they said no. And then when I showed in the provision, I was like, oh, okay, well, we don't have the money. Uh, and there was a study being done and it found that the state agency had $41 million in a reserve fund or reserve fund sitting there. So adding those two together, I'm a firm believer that information is only as good as the speed in which one acts upon it. If I would have just saw that comment in the listserv, in the IE listserv and did nothing with it, then we wouldn't be having this discussion. But okay, once you get them convinced, being a part of the network here, I know PCs for people. You know, and so I don't have to build anything from the ground up. I share their information, the state agency, and they see that they're legitimate. Then we were able to, IBSA is now a vendor, whereas any person, any TANF cash assistance or food stamps recipient across the state of Kansas who's seeking employment, the state has honored that they will pay the one year of internet service through the PCs for people. They will purchase a computer if they need one. And we're knocking out the bugs right now on how to get that digital literacy piece in there and get paid a few dollars to do that. And also within there, within that one comment, uh, the SNAP is sort of different than TANF, but that's the Department of Agriculture. Within that provision themselves, they gave the provision that they could spend SNAP funds for computers, access, digital literacy. The same thing for the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Let's face it, a lot of the conversation had been about kids and they need internet access at home. But what about that parent? They're not really a part of the conversation. If the child is eligible because they are eligible for free or reduced lunch, that means that they're living in a household where there's an adult living in poverty and they are required to seek employment. And many of the jobs that are being sought are online and uh, you have to apply online. So all of this became a no brainer after the fact because of the COVID. And sometimes, unfortunately, it takes adversity to create opportunity. And so if we, if Kansas is a pilot project on one, how do we get state agencies to see that they can actually purchase these things? How do we get them to, uh, we have to help them identify, and this is where the digital navigator portion comes in, because we're going to have to do a lot that the case managers, they have stacks of files like this. They don't know anything about digital literacy, so they're going to rely on us. But I think that if we can get a model together, now that the state of Kansas State Welfare Agency has already said yes, that it becomes a template, whereas if anyone wants to go to their state agency, that maybe this can help open that door because while the pandemic is going on, they're not spending a lot of money on transportation, childcare, uh, and a lot of other things. So they actually are racking up a lot of money. But if we're not coming in asking them, not everyone is going to need the service. In Kansas, Cox Communication is providing wired service to all the homes. But even from a conversation uh, yesterday, <coughs> Their service, with their service, really only two devices in the home for kids doing distance learning can be on at a time. Well, what about that parent there who's online searching for work and job training? So that's the big story of how we got, how we, I got the information, how I transformed it into something that is very tangible right now. Which is fabulous. Uh, and that's definitely a model others can take in their states to convince those who hold uh, administrative strings uh, and can adjust some policies. Okay, we're, we're gonna looking, go. They're looking for ideas. 
they are i think that's absolutely true that's been my experience with them uh, Nicole, some funders are most comfortable providing devices. We've seen that, right? Devices and connectivity. Uh, but there are other needs. Tell us what's happening in Arizona. Right. Well, you know, 2020 has certainly been a learning experience for a lot of us. And, and like we've discussed, there's a lot more attention to the needs of the digital divide and a lot more um, political will to get something done, right? And to, to make something happen. But unfortunately, a lot of times, um, at least in from what I've observed, that looks like doubling down on some short term solutions and, um, you know, kind of meeting the, the technical definition of access, right? Do they have a computer or do they not have a computer? So we've seen a lot of emphasis on focusing on K-12 and thinking that getting a Chromebook out or getting a hotspot out is solving the problem. And just like Lazone um, articulated, we're missing a lot of people when we're only thinking that the digital divide impacts K-12 students. Um, in, um, you know, and we have seen a lot of really great coordination to, to really meet some students' needs. But um, in Arizona, we're trying to think through who are those other populations and groups that we're missing or who might not really be able to participate if they don't have a, a child in the household or something like that. Um, one initiative that we have um, in Arizona is called Connect Arizona, and it was really a very quickly deployed public Wi-Fi map that we put together because we knew that information needed to get out there. We already had public library data. We had some access to other locations data too, so we um, stood that up pretty quickly. Um, and through partnering with different education organizations, we're able to get that word out pretty widely, um, including things like on Telemundo, which was a trip for me, for sure. Um, and that wouldn't have happened if we weren't partnering with people whose sole purpose is to support K-12. Um, we also saw it as an opportunity to um, combine it with our digital navigators program, which is called AZ LibTap, the library's tech access phone line, um, which is a service, um, a, a tech help service for um, anybody in Arizona um, to get information about internet offers, uh, discount devices, one-on-one uh, -on -one help, and in some cases, long-term digital skills uh, planning. So for us, our perspective was, you know, we go with what, um, you know, what information we're being asked for, like a public Wi-Fi map or helping students, and that's the hook, but we also support it with our digital equity, um, you know, philosophy and our, our perspective that we're bringing to that broader conversation. And that's, you know, that's been able to lead to some other partnerships in interesting ways, but I'm finding at all these different tables, it really is an emphasis on connecting students. So that's as we've, um, you know, we've, we're really young at this point, we've only been up for about two and a half months. So we're thinking back about the types of calls that we're getting um, and how we can address some of those, um, those gaps that we've already seen. I love the recognition uh, and the innovation from you all that here's where the awareness and the excitement is. So let's use that and then do some bigger things because folks who are new to the field may only see certain things right we get very we all get very upset when we see the kids outside a taco bell doing their homework right that just makes all of us so frustrated but we don't see the parents right we don't see the grandparents we don't see the aunts and uncles we don't see everybody else because it's not as visible in the news and in our communities so you all find ways to get folks riled up and get their attention um, in bigger, bolder ways than maybe they even knew were possible. Krista, rural LISC has definitely addressed all of the community members and all of the digital inclusion activities. Like you would definitely have a very broad um, way of going at it. Uh, tell us about the digital navigator model and how, um, how it is that you work with your different partners. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, it's certainly been a process of discovery for us in embedding this tech layer, this digital literacy layer into these human service organizations or workforce development or healthcare based or, you know, financial literacy based organizations, supportive housing organizations, the, the 
total group of organizations that are involved in our pilot model are um, listed out in the attachment that Miles put in the chat. Um, and so the clients of these uh, social service organizations are adults, but a good number of um, these folks are in households with, with children. And, and so, um, you know, I'd love to just share the anecdote that um, in our site in West Virginia, our digital navigator site, they have a supportive housing uh, focus there. They have a financial financial literacy focus there. And a client came in seeking support with financial literacy, was set up with a device and was set up with um, a subsidized home internet connection for a couple of months that is not only helping um, him uh, uh, get on a path to um, like a better job and financial wellness, but his children are able to take advantage of the internet being at home. And, and actually one of the stories that he shared with us was they had been walking down to the local elementary school, uh, but now they have a warm place to do their homework at night. And for his part, um, it was able to uh, be supported by our initial digital navigators on the skilling side to set up an email address for the first time. So our uh, partners are really taking this 360 approach and whatever comes at them in terms of what their clients are asking for, they're turning around and um, trying to solution it. Um, but our digital navigator model is absolutely based on um, the model that was put forward by this, this field of practitioners um, the, that NDIA has coordinated, the focus on home-based internet, the appropriate device and um, the basic digital literacy, literacy skills. I can say though that in rural communities, when we talk about access, we are talking about the dearth of broadband being available. And so our digital navigators are recognizing that sort of a phase two opportunity for them um, could be in supporting their clients more holistically um, by advocating for better broadband options in their community. So integrating that access and adoption equation that I think all of us are really invested in. Um, so. Awesome, we should note that the digital navigator model that NDIA has been documenting, uh, two of those working group members are Nicole and Cami. So, um, it, we are very much a community, right? And so the learning flows between our members. Uh, so Cami, let's go to you. You have been doing this work for a long time. Tell us about the shift that you're seeing in partners and funding and how, what Nicole brought up that issue of here's the focus, but then you find these broader things, these you know broader projects. You just have to adapt to what is being thrown at you. And for our agency, we had within a week's time, all of our partners closed their doors. And we have eight full time for the equivalency of that for our staff. So they all had to finish what they could do from home, but then we would have had to lay people off. Thankfully, we were able to take some funding from the city and turn it into the Home Connect program and, and be able to turn that into, at this point, we've trained remotely over 100 people and deployed 150 tablets or uh, devices. That's San Francisco. They come from 10 years of having funding for older adults and people with disabilities, starting with BTOP and having it continue to be funded through uh, general funds. But in Austin, there isn't that same kind of funding for older adults. So when, when um, COVID hit and we saw all this action in San Francisco, I talked to Austin partners and they're like, we're just trying to figure out how to do our staff meetings, right? Uh, the nonprofit structure at the beginning of COVID in Austin, they were all really struggling because pretty much none of the aging service uh, agencies were remote. Everyone was in person. So what I've seen happen locally here in Austin is that the Aging Services Council, this kind of association created a task force and that task force is the group that is pursuing funding and have gotten a small amount of funding and they're really building this incredible momentum. So I'm excited to see that continue post COVID and that we're able to work collectively across these different areas. So in the, the, the social isolation task force, it is 
specifically uh, pulling people from the city, from academia, from nonprofit serving seniors and nonprofits that are tech focused. So we're all meeting regularly and together launched a survey, which Miles will share a link to, that surveyed 654 people, seniors specifically, to ask them about their, their, their needs for um, internet access. So it's really an incredible evolution in the course of six months to see this task force meet and grow and have data and have funding coming in. And it's in some, I'm kind of keeping my fingers crossed that the momentum will keep building, that we can then really raise awareness within Central Texas that older adults are not connected. They're highly isolated. It's causing depression. It's causing you know suicide. It's causing health problems. We need to do more. And to Angela's earlier point, we need to shift some funding priorities to make this something that we can continue to, to grow. And so um, I'd love to, you know, whatever we've learned, I'm here to share with other folks on this particular coalition that's been built. Awesome. Thank you, Cami. Krista, Rural Lisk has been out recruiting your local members to do digital inclusion work who did not previously do digital inclusion work. We're definitely seeing that happen across the country kind of organically, as Cami noted, folks who were just trying to provide services day to day are all like, we have to do this online, <laughs> right? Uh, we're not sure how to do it online and the folks we're serving aren't sure how to do it online. Um, and so I think the timing of Rural Lisk's project was was coincidental, right? Like we, we had already started working with you guys prior to COVID and it just worked out. Well, talk to us about when you go to your sites and say, here, we have this idea, what kind of responses do you get? Yeah, thank you so much. And I mean, just for everybody else, the same story is true for our rural list partners that the digital uh, divide issue has been amplified in their worlds and it's certainly kind of in their, their range of vision. And so this program and sort of a solution kit in the digital navigator model arrived at a terrific, terrific time for our partners to be open to thinking about how they could add what we've been calling this tech layer or this digital literacy layer. And so um, these are folks with a social work background that just sort of characterize um, the typical case manager at our partner organizations and are just invested in figuring out how to help. And I think I have been really open to seeing that uh, that the digital inclusion portfolio enables or follows um, their other case management work. And so I, I would you know, welcome this field of practitioners to carry that, that message forward, that this is something that can be integrated in the other ways that um, we're, we're looking um, you know, to, to serve people and, and to help them move forward in their lives. Um, we launched the program um, in Appalachia um, in, so in seven states in Appalachia at nine sites, um, they all take a, you know, a slightly different um, look at um, their, you know, their, their community supports as, as is outlined in my handout um, that, that Miles um, shared on the chat. Um, so you know, for that individual at a um, supportive housing community, um, the folks there uh, started with a securing devices, they were actually able to leverage um, another uh, public funding um, support in order to um, purchase enough devices that every household in this development would have access to one, and then figured out sort of the next step that a community Wi-Fi solution was going to, uh, was going to be more uh, economical uh, for the entire community than a home internet connection for all. And so it's sort of informed um, how to sort of roll up um, the different supports within the digital navigator program based on the site specific ways that um, the case managers are entering into a relationship with the client. Um, I just wanna take a minute. I, I meant to answer in the chat a question that I got about Roll List Kauai. Um, again, we do have a presence in 45 states, um, have launched our digital navigator, digital equity program of work, um, on the East Coast in Appalachia and then in, in the Delta and are looking to expand that over time, 
uh, in January, supporting a, another set of community partners in the South. Um, but if you, the person who asked, has a relationship with those financial opportunity centers in Hawaii, um, you know, certainly encourage that conversation to get started uh, because we, you know, we do think that there is a multiplier effect with this model. Fabulous. We agree. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Nicole, you work with tribal governments and libraries across the state of Arizona. So talk to us about digital sovereignty, government to government relations, things that are hard. <laughs> sure. I wish we had longer than three minutes and that uh, we could, uh, you know, have some of those uh, cocktail conversations. Um, <laughs> definitely. Um, but, you know, we, you know, the state library is a, a state agency. Um, and in, in this country, there are really three types of sovereigns. There are tribal governments, the federal governments, and states as well. And so a lot of times, if we're thinking about digital equity really as being about addressing institutional and historic uh, inequities, we've got we've to consider this dynamic and really be intentional about how, um, how we're working together. Um, I, I will define uh, digital sovereignty as tribal governments um, and communities having, um, you know, having the right to the telecommunications information and communications technology that's over their land. Um, and from, you know, in the state library perspective, we are also about the preservation and, the, and history. So the knowledge that's online is important as well. Um, but we want to make sure that um, in these efforts, we're valuing um, you know, we're, we're making decisions that are about supporting native uh, government's goals. So one thing that I see in the digital equity field is, um, you know, we, we know things like almost seven in 10 people living on uh, tribal lands do not have access. Um, and the, the danger I think is, is thinking of it as a, um, you know, as the diversity issue or as, you know, a minority group that we can target and solve the tribal digital divide. Um, and that's just that's just a, the, an incorrect perspective to take if we're really valuing uh, sovereignty of native nations. So there's you know 574 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. That's 574 government to government relationships that are each unique uh, between those governments and um, and the federal government. And sometimes the state will be involved in that as well. So when you're you're trying to come up with uh, solutions or projects, making sure that um, we're actually privileging and prioritizing those aims locally. Um, what it means at the state library is that we're re, um, revisiting and reconsidering the ways that um, you know, the state has enacted different institutional barriers to allow direct resources to get to tribal governments in certain ways. So for us, we're in the library world. So that's things like, how can we remove barriers to accessing LSTA funding? And how can we make the E-rate procedures um, and regulations a little bit more expansive to make sure that we can truly get communities connected, um, as well as to reconsider what our role is sometimes as um, you know, passing through with um, state uh, state funding or federal funding as well, and is it always appropriate for the state to have a um, kind of paternalistic uh, role in that process, or should we be investing our times in making sure we're facilitating between uh, sovereign nations um, and the federal government? Um, but at the same time, we you know we have to do right by each other and be um, you know be respectful in all cases, whether you have a decision making uh, power or not. Um, and I'm sure I'll think of a million other things I'd like to say after this. Awesome! It sounds like we should do a whole session with Nicole later. So uh, thank you, Nicole, for that. That was perfect. Let's go to Cami. Um, Cami, when we were prepping for this session, you brought up that there's some concern about um, providing devices and then having those devices be sold. When that comes up, I know L L Zone's like rolling his eyes. Uh, Cami, what do you say when, when people suggest that? Well, I'm trying to help them understand that if we show the learner the value of the device and how it will help them, they will not let that thing go. So if you're just giving it away, then it has little value. But if you show them how to use it and it is impacting their ability to communicate and access information and see their grandbabies and all that good stuff, 
they, they won't even let it out of their hands. So I would encourage them to deploy a training program or at least awareness raising. Layer, layer it on. Here's what you can do with the internet. And that might seem like a silly thing for us to have to talk about at this point. Doesn't everybody know how important the internet is? No, not everybody does know. They're afraid of it. They think it's just for kids. It's full of games. They're too old to learn. I'm 80 years old. I've gotten along this far. You know. So how can you benefit from the internet and layering on some kind of classes that are culturally competent and move at the at the speed in which they can really grasp and enjoy the learning. Um, but you know, there are some people for their life circumstance means they won't be in a position to learn and they're not interested in learning. And they may take that device of value and turn it into a currency that could get them something that they want or need. So but, but what you do is you limit who the, you limit the program to the people who really want to learn. That as adults, we're not gonna learn something new unless there's something in it for us or we wanna do it. Like you're mandated because your boss said you had to, or you are gonna lose benefits if you don't do it, or if you really, really want to do it. So we have to make sure that people are learning the value, gaining that skill. And, and I, I truly believe that they learn the skill and they see what the internet has to offer there's no going back, right? Like, could any of us give up with the internet at this point? You know, maybe for a week on vacation, like, thank goodness I don't have to check my email. But then after that, like there's every minute of the day I'm doing something on the internet or wanting to do something on the internet, looking right. at things and all of that. So, I, you know, and there are places where it is just not reasonable to dis distribute devices, but making a loaner program. So if it's an SRO, have a checkout program. Because not everybody wants technology in their homes. They're suspicious of it, right? It's listening to you. So if you have a checkout program or you have a dedicated space that can be cleaned, those are the things that you might want to consider doing. Thank you, Cami. Lazone, do you want to jump in on that question? Uh, yes, and I agree everything with what Cami had said. What we had tried to do by focusing this specific population in our lane as the uh, agency who works to help people move from welfare to work. By working with people who have their backs against the wall anyway and working with the agency, we really rely on the, uh, the state agency's case managers. They know who's coming and really putting their best foot forward. forward. Um, and these are also people that if you that have requirements, work requirements under welfare reform. You have to be putting in so many applications per week. Uh, and if you aren't, you will lose your cash assistance. If you are not seeking worker involved in an approved job training program and you're receiving food assistance, you will lose that food assistance. So working with the agency, it doesn't guarantee every anything, but it does show that these are those who need it the most, uh, and they have something that if you find someone who understands what they have to lose, if they are not doing what they're supposed to do, then they're more open to doing what they're supposed to do. And then that gets back to not just giving them the device and internet, act, but really having a good digital literacy class to show them it's not just, it's sort of a digital life skills for job seekers is different for those who may be elders who just want to learn how to chat with their grandkids or something of the nature there. And so I think that that creative class, what we have put together is that if you're going to get the computer, the internet access, you also have to have the digital literacy. I will be calling on some of you all to really put something together, 45 minute, two hour. I see where the digital literacy uh, guidebook that is put together. I'm going to try to condense that in because one, if you make it fun, if you have that knack of how to show them how Hey, you can transfer this into uh, being a positive in your life. Kids who are getting iPads and Chromebooks and taking them home, they're not going to let nobody come into their house and steal still work done. But one of the things that I try to share is that if you use your computer and you're using Mavis Beacon and you do 45 minutes a day for three days a week in three months, and you've been unemployed for six months, you will probably type 30 words a minute with 80% accuracy, and I can get you a job that will help move off of wealth. 
Now you should be making more than you should be making enough to where you don't need the ten dollar a month service. You want to go and get the nineteen ninety nine, you know, dollar service. They can see how they can trend from one step to the other, and that's a part of my story. And so, if it got me here, then I have to try to find a way of convincing them that my story is also your story too. And because I'm working with uh, our chamber of commerce and there's a lot of jobs, they're always coming to me saying, Lazone, I need somebody for this. I need somebody for that. When it is known that, well, you need to work with Lazone because Lazone to help you get a job, girl. Then that becomes another testimony to whereas it's, not, but it puts something in there now. Like I said, the most important thing is we're targeting a population that already have their backs against the wall. They don't want to lose their cash assistance. They don't want to lose their food assistance. So they're sort of open-minded on anything. But if we are not putting in the right information into their minds, they might just end up Netflixing and chilling all day. And that's not, these are public funds. And so I'm not an advocate to just give anybody and everybody. I do want some checklists to make sure that the equipment is going to the people who are really hungry to change the trajectory of their lives. So Lazone, let me tell you. So one of the questions that, we, that we've that we received is about um, where limited resources should go. So the question in the chat is, would we get more for each dollar spent to provide the opportunity for a device connection to the internet and digital education to those who really want to do something with it? Then hopefully they will influence those who are less confident or don't trust or whatever. Do or how can we first help those who use the opportunity best? And again, that gets back to getting with the agency that is already providing the assistance and support services to those people who came and asked for help. The welfare agency. Right. But they're also coming to you, right? They don't just go to the agency. They also come directly to you just go to the agency. That's why I set up the deal with the agency. Now I can refer them back to the agency to get that device and get that uh, 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 the internet access. And then they are our clients. And then we sit down and work with them. When they have work experience where they are not at home, but they come and work in our office in lieu of cash assistance for 20 hours a week, they're working and doing office clerical stuff. So they're learning how to use the computer in hopes that when they go home, they will transfer that into this, and that's what they do. They're right. learning things here on Office Clerical that will also get them prepared for uh, for employment. Now, so, let me let me brought in the question out that Stephanie had asked, in that limited resources focused on those who are asking for the assistance. What about folks, particularly our older adults? who are not asking for assistance, but yet if they were connected, their lives would be so much easier. Like they would feel they, the social isolation could be dealt with, you know, doing online banking, all the things that they need to stay safe, telehealth, the things that would keep them from going out and ending up with COVID, right? All of that, but they may not have that awareness. I think that also falls inside use of limited resources. Cami, how would you, how, how do you respond to that? So we are facing that right now. We told our partners, those are the senior serving agencies housing, tell us which of your seniors live alone, lack or have little to no internet access and really want to learn. And those were the three things that we stressed. And they were still just sending us anybody. They were like referring anybody and we'd call them up and say, hi, we're from Community Tech Network, such and such agency referred you. And they're like, who are you? And they would hang up on us because it wasn't clear that this program was real. They thought we were a scam. Too good to be true because we're offering a tablet. I get it. So now we're telling the partners, you need to be crystal clear who we are and what we're doing. And you only refer people who are really interested in learning and that they really need the access. I don't want someone who already has a laptop, who already has, you know, like, no, this is for people who live. What we're also finding is that people are getting in and then going into surgery and being out of commission for months. So we ship them a tablet that just sits there and we're like, okay, partner, please do not <laughs> refer people who are gonna go into, and maybe it's not a planned thing and we get that. So we aren't having tablet ship out and sit on somebody's desktop or on, you know, sit around. And, and so it's just having a really good relationship with a partner, good communication with the partner, and then a back and forth. Cause we've, we have one partner that's referred uh, like of the seven referrals, three of them are not responding to our calls. They're not doing the training. They have like taken that tablet and they are not calling us back. 
And to be honest, like two of them are having health issues. So there's like all these issues with older adults that you just have to be patient about. But so it's sometimes it's just like, okay, partner, we are relying on you to help us use these public funds to the best of our abilities as quickly as possible. And, 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 and it's just, it's an art form, I think. And if a, if a partner consistently provides us people who don't go anywhere, we will cut them off. Right. Gotcha. Thank you. We're getting some questions about digital literacy curriculum. Lazone mentioned uh, digital literacy curriculum for job seekers. Uh, there are a variety of lists out there. Does anyone want to mention particular curriculum you use or point folks to a list? Our NDIA staff will also put in the link to the digital inclusion startup manual. Chapter four has a full list. Anyone else? Lazone, you want to respond to that? Well, yes. Uh, you know, there's everyoneon.org, they have a good curriculum already in place. Uh, I check out the Digital Charlotte. They have a good resource. Uh, and of course, NDIA. And so right now, I sort of, I'm sort of looking at all three of those that already exist. I'm not going to create anything. I'm going to take what already exists. And I do a, a, a one hour workshop because there's a homeless program to, for homeless youth and their parents. And it's only 45 minutes. It's an hour, 45 minutes questions. Uh, and it gets to that attention span. And so I'm in the throes and mix of trying to put together maybe a three or four hour digital literacy job seeking model. And I'm looking at those three or any others that I may see and I'm pulling it together from there. Something that I can have on my big screen and I can go step by step. And when they complete the course, they'll get a certificate of completion. Um, and again, the population that we're dealing with aren't the elders, the seniors. These are people who are already sort of digital literate. They know how to use two fingers on a, on a Chromebook. So it's not so much, a lot of people, they think, well, I'm gonna go to Indeed to look for a job. When the first per place to look for your job is your local newspaper, and your local online state jobs board, because that's where local companies first put their jobs and you can upload your links and do keywords and you'll receive emails, you know, uh, when your keyword pops up on there. So these are some of the things that, that I learned in school and the hard way that I can share with someone who's eager to learn so that when they get that computer, they're not wasting their time. And when we get that site, you know, uh, I will have links to the NDA site any sites that have a curriculum where they can quickly go and get an answer on something or learn something, then uh, that's what I would do. And if anybody is building video content, you know, I think it was boomers, tech boomers. Yes. So what we added into that when, when we updated the startup manual in that chapter four, Paulo added a table. So you can see which ones have tutorials, which what curriculum is directed more towards the trainer rather than the community member themselves. So that's a good place to figure out what's out there regarding the tutorials. Because in this moment in time, when we used to sit next to people and help them learn digital literacy, right? It's more that regard, I know we all want to help one-on-one, -on -one, but the it's, they end up having to lead themselves through tutorials. Nicole, can we yes. turn to train the trainer issues? Um, a lot of our folks do work with partners. They work with others where they need to help provide that training information to somebody who is then going to be that one person someone's turning to. How do you do the train the trainer? Sure. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this in, you know, this search for the most comprehensive digital literacy curriculum that's out there. Um, and, you know, I would also like the most comprehensive digital literacy trainer uh, curriculum, but unfortunately that doesn't exist. Um, but at least in the, the state library, since we, um, you know, we're invested in the professional uh, skills and continuing education of the library workforce. We try to bake in um, digital literacy and and a lot of other topics like cybersecurity, uh, you know, technology planning for libraries and and that sort of thing, and bringing a digital equity perspective to it to really broaden um, you know broaden that conversation. But we've done trainings for library staff that will be on something like um, hardware basics, and we will also include information about hey, there's discount internet offers available in your 
um, you know, in your areas, how can we get this information to your patrons, right? So that they're, you know, they're having a local impact. Um, you know, with our digital navigators program, you know, we had to just stand it up really, really quickly, but we did, you know, have a, a little bit of training at the beginning to help those library staff really understand the full impact of what they're doing beyond, um, you know, beyond just tech support. And that involves things like understanding the local data um, about connectivity so that there are experts locally on what's going on, as well as being able to navigate through all these different provider websites and understand really from a user experience perspective what it's like to um, you know, try to get connected online if you don't have that one-on-one -on -one support. So I just wanted to flag that you know, it is supporting people with developing the skills, but it's also helping the helpers um, to think about things from this, um, this broader perspective. That's perfect, thank you. And we should note, materials from both Nicole and Cami are on the Digital Navigator page, including what Nicole just mentioned. That, and the particular is a question asking about where the Digital Navigator programs are. Digital Navigator is a model. So it is anybody can take whatever they want. We were just told a few days ago uh, that one of NDIA's affiliates went to the page, did some copy paste, submitted it to his local government, got approved. <laughs> So, I mean, they didn't just copy paste, they edited it, of course, but it it's a good starting space and we encourage everyone to do that. And the awesomeness that is the NDIA community is that these four affiliates of NDIA and others help generate that content. We post it, put it in a way that's easy to copy paste, and we encourage you to do that. So it's a model. We're not keeping track of who's doing what, where. We do have a working group for folks to talk to each other. So if you're doing something that you'd be like, hey, we're doing that. We don't call it a digital navigator, but we're doing that. Then we welcome you into that working group because that's where the sharing occurs and we can push out what we learn for everybody else. We have one question in the chat um, that I'm gonna ask folks coming from Jerry. For students with unstable or no internet at home, do you see a need for offline learning content that couples with PCs that does not require internet? This is a tough question, right? When we all want folks to have internet, we want them to have the device, but when that's not possible, do you say, yes, give them a device that they can use without access to the internet? Anyone? You know, I've, I've learned a little bit about offline solutions, and I think there's some contexts where it makes sense and some where it doesn't. My biggest reservation is with that, um, with that um, kind of limited content, you're forced into a relationship of relying on whoever put that together for you. So um, if it's working with, you know, a, a really, with a rural tribe um, and you're bringing an offline internet, um, you know, K-12 curriculum, you know, they have to get that back out to whatever organization is building that curriculum over time. And I don't really see that as being sustainable or truly empowering for the community to get to an online, you know, eventually an online environment. But for, um, for other tribal communities that we work with that are interested in um, things like digital, cultural, and language preservation, we're having the ability to control content in an offline environment so they can take advantage of digital tools for preservation, um, but not necessarily have to share that out where it could be misused or misrepresented. Um, that's also um, you know, a, a, a potential avenue that I'm excited about, but I don't see that necessarily being the um, the emphasis of offline internet. And I connected to that, Nicole, is a reservation I have of if we put resources into this offline solution, are those resources we're not putting into the longer term solution that you defined, which is more empowering than this right. less valuable solution. And I, I, you know, when I've looked at some of these, I said, well, who's teaching those communities to build those, you know, to, to you know, code their own Raspberry Pis and load it with their own content. It's always coming in from the outside with the solution rather than empowering those people to, to build that on their own. Yes, yes, that's true. If we saw that come in, maybe we would respond differently. Lazone, thoughts? Yes, uh, I think that 
whether just like uh, older adults, even young people, when it's something that is relevant to them, then it's something that they want to learn. And that project-based learning, which people are starting to understand now, one of the things that we do, especially uh, we work with first-time juvenile offenders who do community service in our office, uh, they have comp internet at home. They have internet at the school before the pandemic. But what was so, what's so uh, disheartening is that they would come and do community service and they didn't spell well not good in grammar, not really able to, uh, to, uh, do, to read well. And so some of the things that we need done and to expose them to is adding information, creating a spreadsheet in Google Docs and adding information and creating the fields and things. These become assignments of what they do. Now, they may not understand why now, but into typing various documents, they don't know how to bold or bullet or tab and things. So. These are things that you don't need to be online to draft up your term paper or paper that's due, but you should already know how to spell, use punctuation and bullets in bold. And so if uh, I think that there needs to be some type of courses and classes on the offline experience for young people so that if they're coming in as first time juvenile offenders at 12 and 13 here, by the time they're 16 and 17 and they have to do papers in high school or in college, at least they would have been caught up because, well, I remember Mr. Gray say you have to have a space after a period in a sentence. I thought everybody knew that, but apparently that that's not the case. So uh, uh, I think that there is a place for that, but it is more for, you don't have to be on your computer online to type up a grant proposal. You're getting most of that information. You may need to send it to someone, but not to type it up. You just need word. Some of the programs that where they feel that they're learning uh, the dynamics of how to put together sentences, you know, I think that that's something that is 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 needed as a program within itself, and that's where coming in to work at our agency, whether it's community service or volunteers, we get them involved in the typing up documents so that they can get used to typing up six, ten, thirty page documents they're going to have to get used to in the future if they really want to advance in life. Perfect. Thank you, Lizone. Uh, answering one other question that we've received about NDIA's support of digital navigators. We have, we have a situation where we support what's going on out there organically with this working group, meaning we staff the working group, we write up what we learn from the working group. Um, nobody's paying for that, right? That's just, you're a member of NDIA, it's free to be an affiliate, and that you're welcome to participate. And then there are particular organizations we have a contractual relationship with where they feel like they need that extra help from us, and then we do that extra help with them. Um, so last questions for all of our panelists. Um, anything that you want to make sure that folks know that if they are starting out uh, that you're like, oh, I wish I knew, had known. Uh, Cami, let's start with you. Well, obviously they know about the National Digital Inclusion Alliance because they're here, but this is an amazing resource. And the folks that are participating in the listserv, we're all the leaders in the country. Uh, not to toot my own horn or our own horn, but like we've been thinking about this for a decade or more, many decades for some people. So like come to us, we all wanna help everybody succeed at this because that's the only way to get over this big divide. So thanks for joining. Thank you, Cami. Nicole. I'd say uh, partner with your local libraries, partner with your state libraries. Um, you know, Lazona's is uh, listing a lot of issues related to literacy. Uh, you know, libraries are great digital equity champions, but also back to the basics, supporting literacy too. Um, and obviously this NDIA community is so important. Um, I learn so much from everybody per participating in the Navigators program and all the policy that goes out. Um, but I will also, also mention one thing that I've learned during this pandemic um, is, you know, give yourself the permission to say no to partnerships that might not really be um, in your best interest or the best use of your time. Um, again, we want to think about, you know, the end goal of digital equity versus um, just getting devices out. That's perfect advice. And I will hear you, Nicole. <laughs> Lazone. 
Um, I would say, you know, on the local level, there's existing uh, agencies. There's your Chamber of Commerce. There's your workforce centers. Uh, I would inquire about really looking into how can we sell the digital literacy and access to them specifically. They have the funds. They're, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, they're not in this space. They're about the business, so they haven't made that adjustment, but they are comprised of companies that have needs. And if they don't know what we are providing, they will never know. We need to uh, tailor specific programs. What program is in our city may not be useful. But we really, the chamber can be our chamber is a very strong partner on helping us identify and get identified by companies who want to pitch in and do something, but they don't know what to do. So we have to package, you know, who it is, what we're doing and how it's making a direct impact. And then we have to go out there and rub elbows and talk to people outside of our comfort zone. They're not in the library, but they are CEOs and executives of the major companies in your city, in your foundations. I think that they want to hear from us but they're not a sporadic conversation here and there. And so I think that we're moving towards that and using one source as a base of getting information like NDIA, I think that that makes it easier for us to, I can go to Atlanta or Detroit and I can feel comfortable going behind closed doors and speaking to this and generations there, they just don't understand this space. But people in Detroit, in all kinds of cities, they're looking for something and I think we just got to find a better way of delivering a model that works. And that's like PCs for people already had that back office. It cut down the time that we would have had to negotiate with DCF by years. So we already have the piece, you know, as I said, every car that comes in first and last on race day starts as parts in the middle of the floor. We have all the parts. We just have to put our minds together and become those engineers and put it together and get that checkered flag. That's great advice. Thank you, Lazone. Krista, advice to the folks out there. Yeah, well, Lazone just had the perfect metaphor, and I guess I'll dovetail on that by saying that um, you know trust between our community-based organizations and their clients is what gives our model stickiness right now and what gives us short-term impact. But the long-term impact is going to come from being able to integrate all the best practices that are surfaced in networks like this one, um, and then just apply those um, at, through through our partnership partnerships on the ground. So I stay connected to NDIA. I know we certainly will be. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you all. What an amazing panel. We so appreciate you all being with us. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.